Welcome to Computer Science 320, 2014 Winter 2, Midterm 2 Practice Problem Screencast. We are on problem 5.3 right here. And it says, now, complete the divide and conquer algorithm lazy ISP on the next page that takes two arrays by start and by finish as input. By start is sorted by increasing start time, while by finish is sorted by increasing finish time. Each array entry is an object with four fields. Start is the job start time. Finish is its finish time. S index is the job's index and by start, and F index is its index and by finish. So each of these jobs is going to be in both arrays. It's just we wanted to be able to have them sorted by start time and also sorted by finish time. It's kind of handy. So by start brackets one dot start, since that's entry number one, and I'm using one based indexing here, so that's entry number one in the by start array. It's going to be the very first job in order by start time, and the dot start field is its start time, which should be the smallest of all the start times. By start brackets one dot finish is the finish time of that job, and that could be the smallest finish time, it could be the largest finish time, it could be anything in between. It depends how long that job is and where the other jobs sit by start one dot s index is equal to one just because it is this index right here so clearly it's going to be one and by finish brackets by start one dot f index is the same job in the by finish array because this by start one dot f index ought to be the index of that job in the by finish array so when we plug it in we get the same job back again so that is equal to by start brackets one since they contain the same jobs, the length of by start is equal to the length of by finish, which is pretty handy. Now, we're actually doing all this on the next page, so this was all good to know, but we're going to have to scroll down to get any further. So let's scroll down. Okay, here's our algorithm. I'm just going to scroll past it once since it doesn't quite fit on our screen all at once here. And then scroll back up and see what we've got. So we've got this lazy ISP function way up at the top here. And there's not much going on in Lazy ISP. All it's doing is getting us started and then calling Lazy ISP helper. And it seems to be handling one case. That's the case where there are no jobs at all. Once it's handled that case, then it drops down into the Lazy ISP helper function. And let's deal with that in a moment after we figure out what we should do if there are no jobs at all. And you know what? We already figured that out. If, if you look back to part one of this problem, it asked, What's the minimum number of jobs you can do if there are no jobs to do? And the answer was zero. You can do zero jobs. Now, notice we are computing the minimum number of jobs. We are not computing the actual jobs we use in order to get that minimum number. But as we've talked about before, if this is a dynamic programming problem, or a memoization problem, then we're going to be able to take the table that we construct, and from that table, we're going to be able to find out which jobs it was that we used to get that minimum number of jobs. So we'll worry about that later. For now, we'll just compute the minimum number of jobs. Now we call lazy ISP helper with by start, and oops, typo, that should be by start, and by finish. By the way, it's not necessarily a typo just because those are named differently. Hopefully you've learned that in your programming in the past. But since I called them by start and by finish inside the function, that makes it a typo. Okay, and we are also passing two new parameters, min index and max index. And this is really important. This looks like our standard dynamic programming problem where we have these two extra arguments and these two extra arguments, these two extra parameters, they're the ones that are going to define the subproblem. So if we just scan through and see if the recursive calls just pass along by start and by finish, then right away we will know that those parameters are just staying stable throughout. And it's the last two parameters, min index and max index, that identify the subproblem. And knowing that is really, really useful because if we know how we're identifying the subproblem, we know a tremendous amount about the table that we're using. It can help us understand the recurrence. All sorts of things come from that. So I'm just going to scan down now for recursive calls. Obviously, there might be recursive calls in the blanks that we can't see. But the only recursive calls that are already here are down here. Two recursive calls to lazy ISP helper, and they both pass along by start and by finish unchanged. So the two key arguments then 
our min index and max index. Those are the ones that are going to define the table that we will use if this is a dynamic programming problem and we end up caching, that is, storing results along the way. Okay, so let's dive on in. The very first thing we do is we produce this list of candidate jobs. Let candidate jobs be the list of all jobs j such that j.start is greater than or equal to by start brackets min index.start and j.finish is less than or equal to by finish brackets max index.finish. Uh, and this kind of looks like we are restricting the jobs to a particular subset of the jobs. So min index is uh, a limit on the start time and max index is a limit on the finish time. Uh, so it looks like we're pulling out just the jobs that are within the range that are currently under consideration. So if the length of candidate jobs is equal to something, then we're supposed to return something. So clearly this is a base case. If we, if we skim down, we're certainly going to see that the rest of this is, is all inside this else. So, and there's recursive calls in there, so it's a recursive case. This is a base case. When should we stop? Well, we're probably going to stop when the number of jobs is 0. We're going to stop when the number of jobs is 1. The number of jobs in by start and by finish, it never changes because we just keep passing them along. So what matters is how many jobs there are that are actually candidates to be selected in this particular subproblem. And in this case, uh, what base case am I going to use? I don't know. We've only figured out one base case so far, right? The one base case we figured out is when there are no jobs then the minimum number of jobs we can select is none. And that seems like a good base case. I'll just run with it for now. Uh, it doesn't mean it's right. I can always come back to it later on. But it does seem like a good base case. So let's move on to the next part. So otherwise, we're supposed to choose an arbitrary job j in candidate jobs. And then best so far is equal to the length of candidate jobs. So this is our best solution that we've constructed so far, or actually looking very carefully, I see it's the best so far. Sorry about that. How about best so far? So this is as good as we've done so far. It, it, we often initialize something like this to infinity or negative infinity or zero or something like that. We're trying to minimize the number of jobs. The worst we can possibly do is have to use every single job, right? So if every job is non-conflicting with every other job, none of them overlap, then we're going to end up using all the jobs and that will be our best solution. So this is a good starting point. We can't do any worse than that. It probably would have been fine to just say infinity here as well and we would have come up with a good solution. Okay. So best so far presumably is going to get updated later on. Oh yeah, and if, if we jump down, we can see it does get updated. If result is less than best so far, then best so far gets result. So it's a totally typical loop structure where we're going to go through a bunch of options and we're going to keep updating the best so far. And in the end, that is what we return as well. So that's completely standard. We're just trying to minimize over some set of options. Okay, but what is our set of options? Well, here's our options. It's called options, anyway. Construct a list options of all jobs k in candidate jobs with the following relationship to j so that exactly one of options must be chosen. Well, you may not be a mind reader, so it might be hard for you to know what was the person who wrote this thinking when they decided to call this thing options, what did they mean to put in the blank? The only real clue we have here is that it is a list of options. It's got some relationship to J, so we've got jobs K that have relationships to J. And, you know, what relationships do we have? We've got, like, start time comes before finish time, finish time comes before start time, they conflict, they don't conflict, those kinds of relationships. But here's the key part. We want to make sure exactly one of options must be chosen. So if we go back to the problem definition, what makes it so that exactly one of some set must be chosen? Let's jump back up, way back up, right at the start. What tells us that exactly one of some set of jobs must be chosen? Right here. We need to perform exactly one job from each conflict set. That's the core decision that we have. Given a conflict set, we must choose one of the jobs in that conflict set, and we can't choose two. So that's a nice choice point that we can use for divide and conquer. So then 
we want this list options to be a conflict set. Which conflict set should it be? Well, it's all jobs K with some relationship to J. So let's have it be all the jobs in J's conflict set. So I'm just going to erase that underline so we've got a uh, fit here. K conflicts with J's times. That is, K is in J's conflict set. So we've just constructed J's conflict set. By the way, we're probably going to want to do analysis of this later on. How long is this going to take? Well, we just filtered all the jobs down to candidate jobs right at the start. That sounds like linear time. We looked through every single job and we did this comparison. Now we got everything in the conflict set. That sounds like linear time because we have to go through and check everything's times against J's times. So, so far we've, we've already spent linear time. It's not going to matter if we spend linear time again and again and again as long as we don't go over that. Or, you know, we can't spend linear time a linear number of times or some number of times dependent on n because in that case we'll be doing more than linear time. Okay, but let's jump away from analysis and check out the rest of the code here. We've got a for loop and it loops over all the jobs in options. So this is our classic body of a divide and conquer algorithm, or more specifically of a memoized uh, divide and conquer problem or a dynamic programming problem, where we figure out a set of choices and then we look at how good each of the choices is, presumably by making recursive calls. So we're going to compute the result. We're going to compute the minimum number of jobs for uh, each of these jobs k and we're going to do it with two recursive calls and an extra little bit here. So what are the recursive calls and what's the extra little bit? Well, let's jump back up. Okay, These problems are laid out so that you've got a way to think about the steps you might take when you work through a problem. So hopefully you're learning something even from the exam. Wouldn't that be great? You may roll your eyes at me now. Anyway, but I think it would be great. Problem two here had us think about how a job splits an instance into two smaller instances. And that's exactly what we're doing right now. We're saying we're going to take one of the jobs in options and we're going to say, I'll take this job. It might be the wrong choice, but that's OK. We're checking all the possible choices. So whichever one is the best choice, that will be the right choice. Okay. So we check out this particular choice. And all we need to do is construct these two sides now and make a recursive call on them. So the only question is, what do those two sides look like? Well, you know, look on the left here. The left boundary of the left side doesn't change. The right boundary of the left side is going to become the largest index that is smaller than the start time here, right? So we want to find this job's index in the array, and we want to restrict to everything smaller than that. And the right side is going to be similar. The right side of the right side, the right boundary of the right side, is not going to change. But the left boundary of the right side is going to be this job here, the smallest start time that's larger than this job that we're looking at. So let's drop down here and say, let's have this be the left side here. So this is just a comment to ourselves, and this is the right side to ourselves. So the right boundary of the right side stayed the same, so we can just say max index here. And the left boundary of the left side stayed the same, so we can just say min index here. But the rest of it's a little tricky. Um, and you know, it doesn't really fit very well on this line, because what we really want to say, say for the left side, is the index of the, the index in by finish of the job whose finish time, uh, the, the job that has the largest finish time less than the start time of k. Right, so that's the equivalent of what we looked at above. We only want jobs that finish before k starts, 
And our max index then is the job that finishes before k starts but has the largest finish time. So I'm going to do my best to write it in here and, and we'll just slop over. Index of the job in by finish with the largest finish time less than k's start time. Okay? And Notice that uh, that array by finish is sorted by finish time, so we could binary search to find the appropriate job. And now, obviously, we're going to have just as much trouble fitting down here. This is the index of the job in by start with the smallest start time that is greater than k's finish time. So this will be the optimal solution to the left subproblem. This will be the optimal solution to the right subproblem. We're adding them together. Okay. And is that it? Is that all the jobs we used? No, we had to use job k as well, right? We're going to use one of these jobs in options because we must use one of those jobs. So there is one extra job that we need to account for. And that's it. The rest of the construction here, like this part here, if result is less than best so far, the rest of this construction will ensure that we find the option that was best. We have to take one of the jobs from options, but by finding the minimum of all of those results, we'll choose the best one. And that completes our algorithm.